or Jout, uh, with Maché. Uh, I hope my pronunciation is correct. So Maché, you can come in. You have time. We are two minutes. Hello. Hello, Maché. How uh, are you? I'm fine. And you? I'm fine. Great. Uh, so hello from Paris. Where are you? Oh, I'm in Krakow, in southern Poland. Perfect. So uh, we see your screen. Uh, yeah. We start with one minute in advance. So feel, feel free to, to start your presentation. And I'll be back in That's good. That's good. Yes. OK. So my name is Maciej Treder. Uh, it has been pronounced very, very well uh, by the host. Thank you for having me here. What you can see right now is my handle. Uh, I have a chance to register in the most of the social networks under the same nickname. So if you would like to follow me, for example, on Twitter, where I am mostly active, just type my name and surname together so you will find me. Uh, today presentation is available for you offline on my speaker deck. You can scan the QR code right now. Uh, if you won't have enough time to take out your phone and, and scan it, no worries. I will also uh, pass uh, paste this link uh, in, the, in the chat. So to the point, what are JSON Web Tokens? This is the question which I'm going to try to answer today. Uh, but before we will get, uh, go into that, uh, I would kindly ask you to close your mind, uh, close your eyes, get deep into your memory, and get back to the school time. Let's meet the actors, the children. So on the very left, we have a, a one person, the, the Bob or Mike uh, or, or any other name which you like most. On the very right, we have a Kate. And in the middle, we have a bad guy, a person who is always breaking the lessons and making not nice things to, to his colleagues. And let's call him Peter. So the story is that the person on the very left, Mike, very like, likes Kate uh, and he wants to, uh, to say that to Kate, but of course he is too shy to do it personally. So he writes a letter, puts it into the envelope and asks his colleagues to pass it over uh, to, to Kate, who maybe will become his fiance. But in the middle of this conversation, we have the man in the middle, the bad guy, who is trying to make some mess. So he changes the content of the message. And this is how the problem starts. And this is the typical man in the middle attack. Uh, so what uh, Kate and Mike can do uh, to, to avoid that, to, to protect themselves against such situation. So what they agreed to do is to exchange between them a key which they are going to use to, uh, to cipher their messages. Uh, the problem is that if you are using the single key, you are using the symmetric cipher. So the same, uh, the same key is used as well for encryption as for decryption. Uh, it's still hard for the, for the attacker, for man in the middle to guess, but if he will be in the middle uh, of the conversation when the key is exchanged, he is able to produce the messages and read the messages, so still act uh, act here and, and break the relationship between Mike and Kate. So what they agreed to do as a next step is to use the asymmetric cipher. So what we've got here is the private key and public key. In fact, they can be used interchangeably uh, so the name private or public is just an agreement between us which key we are going to share, which we are going to keep uh, to keep secret. The the point of the asymmetric cipher is that it is basing on the one-way functions. Uh, the one-way function is a function which is easy to calculate uh, when you know the factors of the function, but it's very hard to guess what factor has produced the given output. And the example of such, of such uh, function is the multiplying by themselves the prime numbers. So for example, you can multiply five by 13 very easy. Everyone knows that the, uh, that the solution is 65, but it's hard to guess what 
two numbers produce the 65 as an output of uh, multiplication. Uh, so in the asymmetric cipher board, Mike's and Kate's shares only their public keys. This is what they are exchanging between them and keeps their private keys in secret. When they want to produce the cipher, they need to use different keys uh, they need to use different key, then they want to decrypt the, the cipher. So right now, uh, the message again becomes the something encrypted. It's, it's hard to guess. But if we have a man in the middle in the conversation, he's only able to produce the messages or read the messages, depending on which key uh, you used for encryption or decryption but he's not able to completely break the conversation. So let's say that my that my uh, Peter, the bad guy, is able to read the messages so he know what the conversation is about, but he's not able to produce messages because he does not possess any private key. Uh, of course, more uh, some people might say that when you get the public key, you have that modulus which is used to uh, produce the cipher. So you could break the RSA, but it's not so easy. As I said, uh, multiplying prime numbers is easy to do one way, but it's very hard to guess, to, to make the reverse uh, equation. And in the real life, we are using the very, very big numbers to produce the RSA keys which is one of the examples of asymmetric cipher implementation. What you can see right now is an example of 1024-bit uh, modulus. So this is the output of the multiplication of the numbers P and Q, which you can see right now as well. Uh, and as you can see, those numbers are really, really big. So it's, it's very hard to guess those two. And there are only two numbers which produce this particular output. Uh, but as we said, Peter is still able to produce messages. How we can prevent him from doing that? Uh, to, uh, to prevent this situation, we are using the mechanism which is called signing. So we are writing the message, hashing it with some uh, hash. It, it may be MD5, for example, uh, encrypting the hash with our private message then we need to combine the original message with the encrypted hash together and encrypt that that all with the public key which we have from the second part of the communication right now when we when the receiver gets our our message he can first of all decrypt it, this using their private key so the output is the original message plus the encrypted hash he can hash the original message, decrypt the hash which he received using the public key obtained from us and compare those two hashes if they equal. And this way uh, of uh, communication is good when you want to keep your message secret and you want to prove that you are the author of the message. But there are some situations when you don't need to keep the message secret. And such use case would be uh, what I am calling a kingdom. So every kingdom has a king and some citizens, and very often those citizens are many, many, many of them. What if king want to announce something to his citizens and uh, prove that he is the announcer? Of course, he is not asking every citizen in the kingdom to generate the pair of public and private keys and he collects the public key from everyone in the kingdom to produce the message uh, for every particular person. Instead of that, King is uh, generating his own part of keys because King plus stamp give us the King's edict, which is stamped. And everyone knows that this is the, uh, this is the, the legit uh, kingdom announcement. So King produces the power of keys, keeps his private key in secret and use this key to sign the announcements and asks everyone in the kingdom to take from him the public key so those people can verify that key is the author of this announcement. Moreover, King doesn't care about the 
encrypting of the announcement. He is okay to let everyone to read the announcement. He want everyone to be able to prove that he is the author. So what King do to sync the announcement in the IT world? So first of all, he creates the message, then he hashes it, and instead of uh, he's encrypting it with the private key, and right now he's combining the message together with that encrypted hash, which is the signature together, and this is what he is sync. Right now, when someone in the in the kingdom want to read the message, he can do that uh, without any action. He see the plain text that from tomorrow, everyone in the kingdom must use his left hand to open door. But he uh, want to prove that this is the, the legit announcement, not that someone from the kingdom next to us is spoiling us and want to want to make some not nice things inside our country. So when he wants to do that, he hashes the message, decrypt the signature using the public key that he obtained from the king, and compare those, uh, those two hashes, one from the decrypted signature and one he produced by himself, if they match. And this is uh, what most people call JWT, and this is what more people think about when they tell JWT. But in fact, this example is example of JSON Web Signature. Uh, what JSON sets Web Signature is, it says uh, encoded string. If you will decode it, you will get a regular plain text together with some uh, with some uh, encryption at the very end. Uh, the first part of this string is the header, where we are usually putting the information about the token type, the algorithm which we used for signature. The second part is the body, and the last part is a encrypted header and body together. So our signature as we had in the example with King and Kingdom. Uh, so what is JWT? Let's answer the question from the beginning. And the JWT does not exist itself. Uh, you could think about the JWT uh, as an abstract class, which uh, which can be represented by multiple implementations, and one of those implementations is JSON Web uh, JSON Web Signature. Uh, another is JSON Web Encryption, uh, and I think that those two are are the most um, are the most common. So since now when I'm going to use the term JWT and JWS interchangeably. I'm going to focus on JWS. So what most people call JWT. Uh, so uh, let's go forward. What we've, what we've got inside the header and payload, uh, we call those claims. And those claims are divided into two groups, now two main groups. The first one is registered claims. And those claims are information about the algorithm, token type, who is issuing the, this token, uh, who is the receiver, about who this token is, uh, when the token is expiring, or the unique identifier, which uh, is useful when you want to introduce the single use tokens. Another group of claims are custom claims. And this group is divided into two subgroups the public claims and private claims. Uh, so let's start from the private claim. This is the custom claim. So you can put to the token, whatever you would like to, you could call it, let's say name and surname, um, privileges and so on. But if you want to be sure that no one in the world uses this claim, you want to ensure that you are the only uh, organization who uses that claim, you can register it within the IANA JSON Web Token Registry. Uh, in most of the cases, you don't need to do that. Uh, the, the agreement between you and who is using the token is enough uh, to, to make this technology working for you. As I said, you can put into token whatever you would like to, and I put my name and surname and some privileges in the system which I'm going to introduce just right now because this uh, particular token leads us to the to the use case example. Uh, 
so let's think about the pre-JWT authorization. We've got a uh, Kate who is the who is working for the aviation company. We have the authorization system. We have booking system, flight management system, and gate management system. Whenever Kate wants to, oh sorry, whenever Kate wants to do something uh, during her job she authorized herself within the uh, against the authorization uh, authorization system probably used private key to uh, to encrypt her user id uh, let's say that it sends this user id inside the cookie the encrypted user id and now whenever kate posts something uh, to any of the microservices she's sending this uh, this cookie with uh, with the request and the microservice can ask the authorization service if this particular user with this user ID should be able to perform action that he's trying to do. Uh, the problem here was that additional communication. So what we could do is to move the, uh, the public, uh, public key to the microservices, but still uh, we, are, we are getting uh, read of the additional communication but still the the time the the operation of decrypting the cookie the decrypting of anything is a time consuming operation so the jwt answers the pro this problem uh in some part in fact so let's say that kate authorized herself again and in return she got the json web token which is in plain text together with encrypted signature so right now all of those microservices can check if in this token, without decrypting it, if in this token is particular uh, privilege, which should be. And if this privilege is there, then it can introduce this time consuming operation of verifying the signature. Uh, the example implementation of that I prepared in, uh, in the spring. What you can see here is the handler for the change gate endpoint uh, as you can see we are at the very beginning uh, we have information that the token is sent in the header uh, then we are decoding it and checking if it have the privilege of change gate if this privilege if this uh, will return true we are going to the next part of the logical statement so we are introducing the time consuming operation of verifying the signature Otherwise, we are throwing the uh, exception which should be handled somewhere in the microservices, probably by returning the 403, uh, 403 uh, response code. Uh, moreover, when you are using the JSON web tokens, you can delegate the operation of verifying the claim at signature to the load balancer, so you are offloading your microservices even more. If you are able to delegate this to load balancer, you can also delegate it to third parties, to content delivery network like Akamai, so you can offload traffic to your system. And this is one of the features, one of the functionalities of the product which I was working for a couple of years. The product is called Akamai API Gateway. And we were a part of verifying different things for our customers. We are asking uh, if they want us to validate JSON web tokens on behalf of them uh, within the APIs which they registered in the Akamai. So we were asking which endpoint they want to protect with JWT, how they, how they, want, to, uh, how they want to verify the claims, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, for further reading about JSON Web Token, I strongly recommend you to read the article by my friend from Akamai, which is available at the Akamai blog. Uh, you can also uh, dig into one of my publications on Twilio Voices uh, about protecting microservices uh, written on Node.js with JWT. Uh, so let's move to another uh, use case scenario of JWT, which is OAuth. Uh, so what we've got here, uh, the, the window which most of you know, uh, and we have three actors right now, the application, the authorization service, and the resource service. So let's say that application want to get some pictures from Facebook. Uh, 
So what it does, it's authenticate against the Facebook authorization system. Then we've got an access token. We use this access token to request the resource from the resource server. Then we validate, then the resource server validates the token against the authentication service. Now, once the token is valid, we get the resource in return. But if OAuth uses the JWT under the hood, he can, th this uh, implementation can get rid of that additional communication between the authorization and resource server by validating the token, pre-validating the token by the resource server itself. Uh, so we are done with the JWT. This is what JWT uh, main concept is. Let's move to another very useful thing which relates to JWT. And this uh, thing is the JSON web key set. Uh, this is the, the repository of key which answers the problems and needs like what if I want to rotate key or invalidate the access once I give the JSON web token to someone. Uh, so how JWKS works is that it's adding to our JSON web token two additional claims. First of it is the key ID, which says which key should be used to verify signature of this token. And the second claim is JKU, which points to the repository of keys. Now, whenever Kate wants to book something in the system, the booking service goes to the repository key, obtains the key with the public, uh, with the given public key ID, and uses this key to verify the signature. So instead of having the key, public key hard-coded on the microservices, on the microservice, we are obtaining it from the repository uh, on each request. Uh, how the key is stored? It's similar to JSON Web Token uh, as, as the, the name says is JSON Web Key Set. So they are stored in the JSON format. Uh, we've got the information about the key tab, of course, the ID algorithm which is used, uh, which with which this key should be used, uh, the exponent of the of the key and the modulus, the modulus uh, which is the output of that one-way function, this big. Uh, number which is produced by multiplying uh, prime numbers by themselves. Uh, moreover, inside the JSON Web Key, a part of those standard attributes which we will find most often, you can also keep information which are relating to the private keys because you can keep private keys there as well. But we are going to focus on the on the public key examples. So let's think about another use case when the private key from the authorization service has been compromised, so the attacker, the bad guy, can produce the tokens and sign them using the legit private key. What you can do right now is to rotate your keys inside the public keys repository. You don't need to inform the microservices about that. Uh, and now whenever the attacker will reach the microservice and microservice will ask for key with given key ID, uh, it will obtain, he will obtain the different key uh, than it should. So the, it will deny access uh, for, for the attacker. Mm. Okay, we are running out of time. So I'm going to quickly, uh, quickly jump by the pitfall and vulnerabilities and go to my favorite one, which is the most interesting. Uh, And this, oh, this is the very important, so I'm going to skip here for a while. What you need to remember is that JSON Web Token is not a place, oh, sorry, it's not a place for the sensitive data. Uh, it's, you shouldn't keep the information about the credit card numbers, social security numbers, and so on here. Uh, moreover, uh, you need to remember that decoding is not verifying. So uh, if something is in, uh, in the token, it doesn't mean that it should be there. Uh, you still need to verify the signature to ensure that uh, this particular information should be inside the token. You should think about the JWT as a hash code method in Java, for example. So with hash code, you can preliminary check if two objects are possibly equal 
but to determine if they are equal, you still need to use equals. With hash code, you can only determine if two objects are for sure not equal. So same applies to JWT. If something is not in the token, then it shouldn't be there. If something is in token, you still don't know if it should be there. So that's very, very important. And let me quickly go to JKU. So what you need to also check is uh, to never ever trust the token itself. Because what attacker can do is to build his JKU uh, repository and sign the tokens with his, with his keys. So your microservice will never ever uh, verify the legit JK, uh, JWKS repository. And this is why at Akamai, we are always asking customer to pro provide the list of the host names, which we should trust that are legit JWKS repositories. Uh, okay, that's all from my side. Uh, as I said, I'm going to uh, pass the I'll pass the link to the to the presentation on the screen uh, to the chat and you can still follow me and I'm asking you to do that because from time to time I am sharing some some updates which might be interesting. Thank you for your attention and thank you for thank your time. you very much Mache. Uh, we we don't have that for question but uh, really you you made the the best representation ever of man in the middle. Really, yeah. with, uh, uh, it, it's the best we've ever seen. Jeremiah, Jeremiah Lee was also uh, uh, agree on that. And that, that was a very good presentation, many good insights about JWT. And uh, uh, we're looking forward to uh, have the links uh, to your slides and feel free to uh, ask questions to Mathieu in the chat. And now we'll uh, see Jean-Baptiste Javier.